This is the Paul McGuire Report, and on today's program, we're going to talk about how to get wisdom and guidance and knowledge in life. In other words, if an individual, male or female, has wisdom or knowledge or guidance, then their lives are going to be far better off than the person who doesn't have wisdom and knowledge and guidance. So the question is, how do you get wisdom, knowledge, and guidance? Now, there is worldly wisdom, and worldly wisdom is not all uh, bad. There are a lot of people who um, have wisdom, uh, and they're able to navigate their lives in such a way that they prosper, uh, they seem to be psychologically whole, their relationships are psychologically uh, prosperous to one degree or another. Uh, there's a lot of people who are not Christians who, to one degree or another, are living uh, prosperous lives. So there are areas in human wisdom that are beneficial, but the key is we need to be selective about what those areas are. Now, Perhaps the most powerful book in the Bible um, on how to gain wisdom and knowledge and guidance is the book of Proverbs. But it's not just in the book of Proverbs. The mere reading of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation will pour wisdom into your life. Because there's all kinds of wisdom. I mean, there's just an enormous amount of wisdom and guidance and insight um, from Genesis to Revelation in every chapter of the Bible. It's bursting with wisdom. But if we were going to look for a particular chapter where God wants to give us knowledge and wisdom, uh, an excellent chapter, but certainly not the only one, would be the book of Proverbs. So I want to talk about some of the principles in the book of Proverbs, but I want to connect the principles in the book of Proverbs to some of the nitty-gritty issues of life, the real world. And I want to explain from the book of Proverbs how God's supernatural wisdom and knowledge can really make a difference in your life, uh, in the lives of people that you might care to share this with. God's wisdom is really, it's, it, it, it can make or break somebody. Now, God often gives people who are not even his own children wisdom so that they can function and be a blessing to uh, his people. He often does that with leaders throughout history, political leaders, kings, etc. Uh, many times God will give these men supernatural wisdom so that they can function efficiently and be a blessing. But there are other times when a nation is wicked and rebellious where uh, God gives them leaders that essentially impart foolishness to them, and that can be very, very destructive. So as we approach wisdom, I want you to think for a moment about, I don't think of it in terms of uh, religious ideas, religious um, concepts, religious beliefs, because if you do that, you're going to put the power of God's wisdom and knowledge into you know, what I call a little shoebox. You're going to limit it. And not only are you going to limit it, you're going to dumb it down, and it won't be of any good to you or anybody else. Do you think, for example, that the average person in America or the world who is not a Christian, do you think that they look at the Christian culture, the people in the Christian culture, people who call themselves Christians, do you think they look, look at them and do you think that they have a high degree of respect for those individuals? 
do you think that they would consider those individuals uh, as people who possess a superior knowledge or wisdom? And do you think that they would look at their lives uh, with a certain amount of, let's say, healthy envy and say, gee, I would like to be like that? Do you think that's what's going on? Well, I don't think you can make a blanket statement. I think there are many, many people in the United States and around the world who are Christians and whose lives and lifestyles and personalities are such that people see wisdom in them, knowledge in them, guidance in them, and there's something about their lives that that they would like to emulate, that they would like to have, that they envy. And those would be those Christians who, who are supernaturally walking with the Lord and who are renewing their minds with the Word of God. And God has shaped their lives like a sculptor. And because he's done a work in their lives, um, people who do not know the Lord look at their lives and are attracted to it. And that's uh, one way that people get one to Jesus Christ. But I would have to say that if we were going to talk about um, the majority opinion, and we have, we're have we dealing with, with two interfering factors, the media and the educational system, so it's not really a fair competition because the media and the educational system, both of them um, marginalize, diminish, distort, ridicule, mock uh, true biblical Christians. So in the consciousness of the public, they've been programmed to look down upon Christians and to be biased and prejudiced against them. You know, Christians are the subject of jokes constantly in the media and in film and television. And it's not because they necessarily deserve it. It's because the world um, doesn't necessarily like some of the things of God, and so they target Christians. Now, there's another element, though, that we have to look at, and that is the fact that there are many people who call themselves believers in Jesus Christ or Christians whose lives are either mediocre spiritually or out of balance or there, there, there's no evidence that's measurable to the non-believer uh, of, of the reality of God in their lives. And therefore, they look at these people and they say, you know, I don't want to be like that. It's the last thing I want to be like that. And sometimes that's due to um, what I would, I'm going to use some words to describe, and I don't want it to, to offend anybody. I mean, it's a common uh, word, so it's not, it's, it's not an obscenity or anything like that. But I'm not trying to be unkind, but I am trying to, uh, repeat what I've heard the world uh, say about some people who are Christians. And you have too, what I'm about to say to you. you. You've heard the same thing. In fact, you can see it or hear it in movies and television. And that is this, this, uh, this uh, kind of stereotypical Christian who's kind of like wacky or a nut, and so for many people, they think of Christian, they think of religious fanatic, nut, so on and so forth. And I would have to say there's, an, I don't know if there's an unusually high percentage of those people in the Christian community, so much as the fact that there are those people in the Christian community that uh, sadly to say, manifest those attributes of being a nut, a religious nut, or whatever. And so they, they, they create a lot of commotion. They create a lot of attention. And they, they become 
like the stereotypical Christian because they because they're they have no internal restraints on their behavior. That part of the problems they have. They just they they act crazy and weird, and they dress different and weird, and they say weird things. And they're uh, they don't come off as psychologically whole. Okay, they come off kind of like crazy. Okay, so that's an unfortunate reality, but it exists. Now, I want to address that, though, for a moment, because there's a reason for that. And the reason, and I've thought about this a great deal, the reason we have uh, a relatively high percentage of what we would call people who the world would consider religious nuts or fan religious fanatics or crazies, or they, you've heard the joke, it's in the media, you've heard it at work. Oh, you know, my uncle, my, my, my daughter is, became a born again Christian, or her husband of born again Christians, and everybody just like, <clears throat> you know, the, immedi the, the, the immediate stereotypical response is they're telling you, you know, that you, you got to get saved, you're going to go to hell. Which is true, but you know you don't look in somebody's face and shout that at them, and so these people are perceived uh, as odd people, and 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 it's not not so much that they're perceived as odd people because they believe these things; it's how they conduct their behavior, and how their behavior connects with their beliefs that that makes them weird. So if I was going to be simply looking at it from a secular perspective, which I'm not, I'm going to look at it from a biblical perspective, I would say, now, again, this is looking at it from a secular perspective. I would say that um, Christians have a PR problem, a public relations problem, and they have a marketing problem. Their product is Jesus which is the best product that ever was. But, but the marketing of that product, the public relations of that product, is awful. Now, that's from a purely secular perspective. Obviously, Jesus Christ is not a product. He's the, the Son of God. But I'm using worldly principles to, to help us identify a problem. Because everybody understands what I just said. If I said it in a very spiritual way, it would be very complicated, and probably nobody, including me, would understand what I'm trying to say. So you heard it in a nutshell. No pun intended with the nut. Um... Some people would get offended by that. But I'm not talking about anybody in particular. I'm just saying this is a reality. Now, I thought about this for many years, by the way, and pondered it. Not like I you know, have a lot of idle time on my hand and I'm sitting there you know, in a, in a study with books, smoking a pipe like the, the Christian author and intellectual C.S. Lewis. I don't smoke, but... Uh, and I don't have a whole lot of time to, to ponder stuff, but I do ponder stuff. Okay, I think about stuff, and I realize this is this is the there's there's several problems that are causing this, and one is that we have uh, let's call them cultural adversaries, which are really spiritual adversaries, demonic powers. But they, they represent themselves as cultural adversaries. And they uh, do everything in their power to demean, distort, belittle, uh, and, and brand Christians as weird, crazy, obnoxious psychopaths. Oh, man, I cannot tell you. I don't watch these movies, okay? But I can't tell you the number of movies that I'm aware of because... If I'm looking to watch a movie, I might see a trailer or read a description or I've heard something about it. And the number of movies and episodic TV shows and TV shows 
you have this stereotypical character. It could be a female Christian or a male Christian. It's, it's a complete lie. But they, but they keep producing these films over and over and over again. So people get this message in their subconscious minds that Christians are really weird and, and psychologically messed up. And that is, they create these characters um, where you have uh, uh, a psychopath, serial killer, pervert, or whatever, mass murder, or whatever. And they're a born-again Christian and a religious fanatic. You see, that's overdone. No, no, by the way, no other religious group would tolerate uh, or allow themselves to be betrayed in that way over and over again. So, in a sense, you know, it's you can't blame God. And you have to say, well, why is it happening? Well, I'm going to be very, very blunt with you and very, very much to the point. I'll tell you exactly why it's happening. And it's something that I disagree with strongly. Christians have communicated to people in American society and around the world, but especially in American society, Christians have communicated for the last hundred years at least in a whole multiplicity of ways. Christians and Christianity and Christian leaders and individual Christians have communicated to the surrounding culture that we are a soft target. And you can abuse us, you can make movies making us psychotics and serial killers, you can attack the tenets of our faith, you can mock Jesus Christ. Who was it, that, that artist, Rob, Robert Maplethorpe? Don't be offended by what I'm about to tell you, because this was national news for a number of years that Dr. James Dobson talked about on his program, Focus on the Family. And I, it's so vulgar, I won't get into the vulgarity, but a famous artist named Robert Maplethorpe did a whole series of uh, very uh, graphic X-rated type material. But the most offensive part of all was that one of his artworks was that he put a crucifix, I think it, Jesus was on the cross of the crucifix, and he stuck it in a jar of urine. And that was his, you know, you, know, you, th you think that it can't be. Well, that was his, his art. And he photographed it, and it became a fam famous picture. And he also put it into, uh, on display at art galleries and prestigious art showings because he's a highly respected, critically acclaimed artist. Now, Think about the fact that he just, without hesitation, put Jesus Christ on, a cro on the cross in a uh, big glass of urine. Okay, that, it's obscene, it's offensive, basically he is, he's not, he's not some obscure artist. He, th th this picture went everywhere. Okay. As, as, as disgusting as it is, the picture was shown everywhere and talked about everywhere for years. It's still talked about. So because of his power as an artist, he uh, slammed home a message, of, of which was essentially he was saying, this is what I think of your Jesus, and this is what I think of Christianity. And putting it in a glass of urine. I, I don't need to go into detail of what that means, but that's what he was saying. Now, back to Christians being a soft target. He felt free to do that, as so many artists and so many people in our society do today. They portray Christians as psychotics in, mo in movies. There was a I forgot the name of the movie. The, the, the director, I think, is a very, very good director, Martin Scorsese. Brilliant director. But he is a very violent director and brutal director. Now, you can say that is, you know, not godly. Well, um, I have a, a different... Um, 
a slightly different take probably than a lot of Christians on, on certain things because coming from a family of artists, you see, the first thing I would ask myself is, in terms of Martin Scorsese, and he did, I believe he did that movie, Taxi Driver, with De Niro and the young girl at the time, who Jodie Foster. And he did uh, a movie called Casino, and he was probably best known for Goodfellas, which was kind of like a uh, Godfather-type picture. I did a lot of gangster movies and other movies. And, and he's a very, very good director. So if you're going to look at his, his directing and his movies from a technical standpoint, from a screenplay standpoint, from a cinematography standpoint, from an acting standpoint, directing standpoint, he is an artist's artist. And so because he's an artist's artist and he bothered to pay the price to master the craftsmanship of writing, directing, and producing movies, he has power and respect. See, that's something that Christians, they want to cheat on this. Uh, and the reason they want to cheat on it is because I'm speaking to you now about something that is, is, is of tremendous importance and it relates to our topic of wisdom. And, and, and you have to really if you're not familiar with what I'm, I'm saying, I would really encourage you to, to understand it and master it. Because if you do, uh, you and the people you love will be able to grow uh, into the destiny that God has for you, no matter what that is. And it will be something of excellence. The problem is, is that Christians, because they did not maintain a biblical theology. Now, what I mean by a biblical theology, I mean their belief systems in every area of life was not connected to and integrated to what the scripture was saying in what we would call a biblical worldview. <clears throat> and as such... Uh, there was a departure from the Christian culture and ch churches and Christians from, uh, from the Word of God. And this happened, it began to accelerate uh, probably <clears throat> in the mid-1800s. And what happened was a, a great divorce occurred. And the great divorce was... There, there now was a completely non-biblical divorce or separation between Christians and churches and Christian leaders and artistic excellence, excellence in literature, excellence in science, excellence in physics, mathematics, excellence in medicine, sculpture, painting, music, whatever. You, you, do you understand what I'm saying? All of these spheres of activity where a hundred years earlier, Christians were at the front and center. They were at the very tops of these fields. And as such, people respected uh, their Christianity because they were men and women of exceptional excellence. I mean, you can go back to the great composers in Europe, and so many were biblical Christians. But the music that they composed was, was on such a high standard that it had the respect of the secular world. Many of the greatest scientists in the history of mankind um, were Christians. And had a biblical worldview, and they discovered uh, principles in physics and mathematics and scientific discoveries that shaped the world. And they too had this is before evolution. They too had the respect of the the surrounding world. And uh, artists, uh, visual artists, painters, 
sculptors, musicians, scientists, thinkers, writers, some of the greatest writers in the history of literature were Christian uh, authors or authors who had a biblical worldview. But their literature was just purely on a literary level. It was so excellent that they had the respect of the world and society. And that's why, beginning in the 1600s, when the pilgrims and Puritans came to America and entered into a covenant with God, based on the covenant that God uh, made with the children of Israel, uh, codified in Deuteronomy 28, the chapter of the blessings and the curses, God honored that covenant that the pilgrims and Puritans who settled America uh, made with God. And America is unique and exceptional because however imperfectly um, America or a remnant of American Christians attempted to follow the Lord and the, and the Lord ra raised up America above all the nations of the earth. Now, these pilgrims and Puritans were not fools. They were brilliant men and women. And I need you to really track with it. Some of you know this already. Some of you don't. So if you don't, you need to really track with me because it'll change your entire life. They were brilliant people. So you, you, we have to understand this. We have to own this. We have to master this. If we're going to occupy the land spiritually, there will be no occupation of the land spiritually, no influence upon the culture or politics or science or whatever, until the Christian culture ends this divorce between art, science, literature, mathematics, and physics, because that divorce was never made by God. It was made from the tragic theological era of Christians who came after the Pilgrims and Puritans. And the Pilgrims and Puritans, um, they... First of all, they homeschooled their children, and then they developed the community schools in America, you know, during the 13 colonies before uh, 1776. And then they developed schools, too. Not what we would call public schools. They were, they were schools of education, homeschooling and regular schools of education that were run by the Pilgrims and Puritans, and they ran major universities, colleges, high schools, and their academic excellence was so high that, e that many of the founding fathers, who were not even Christians, went through the Pilgrim Puritan educational system because it was so superior and produced so, so, so uh, excellence. So, you know, at a young age, Pilgrim children knew Hebrew, Greek, uh, Latin, they understood and knew the Bible. They understood philosophy. They understood economics. They understood the arts. They understood culture. They understood history, <clears throat> mathematics, and physics, and science, and so forth. And they knew theology, and they knew their Bibles. So, if you were to compare the thinking ability and the knowledge ability of the pilgrims and Puritans and their children, if you were to compare it to Harvard and Yale today, or the greatest secular schools, or the public schools, or even the Christian religious schools, none of the contemporary uh, educational systems in our society remotely, even remotely come close to the excellence of the Pilgrims and Puritans. They, they taught, their students learned, and they had advanced intellects. Now, you really need to grasp this with a vengeance. I'm very serious about this. If you want 
to have power in your life. And God wants you to have power in your life. So if you're sitting there babbling to yourself saying, well, I don't want power in my life because I might be pride. Well, then you know what? Uh, you need to start rethinking your position on the Bible and, and not say that because that's not what God says. God wants to use you, but the people he can use the best are the people that are equipped. So if God wants to give you power, uh, allow yourself to be shaped by the Lord and developed by the Lord and given wisdom by the Lord so that when he gives you power, uh, you know how to use the power wisely, not like a fool. Remember in the Old Testament, it says it is God who gives you the power to get wealth. But he expects you to develop yourself and be wise. So when we compare the intellectual ability of the pilgrims and Puritans and the schools and their children, they were so far superior, so far beyond the academic ability, the thinking ability, the learning ability, and the knowledge ability of kids in Christian schools today, uh, adults or young adults in universities and colleges like Yale, Harvard, Princeton, uh, even the best of the uh, Christian colleges and Catholic colleges, they were intellectually superior in every way. And they, they had a broad scope of knowledge. And they were deep thinkers. They didn't have a suppressed development of the right brain. Their right brain was fully developed, so they were big thinkers, big picture thinkers. And as such, they were powerful people. And it was out of that dynamic power, it was out of that dynamic intellectual, spiritual, theological power, it was out of that dynamic power that the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence, and our whole form of government inevitably flowed from the power and the excellence and the intellectual ability and the history and theology of the Pilgrims and Puritans. Now that's a fact. And the reason for it is that the Pilgrims and Puritans had a deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They loved the Old Testament as much as the New Testament. They knew the, the Old Testament in depth, and they knew the New Testament in depth. And they were born again, but they allowed their minds to be renewed by God's Word, but they also had intelligence and knowledge and wisdom. And therefore, they produced powerful children, powerful people. They were powerful. They were respected. Because they did not succumb to what American and European Christians uh, gave into, uh, starting around uh, the early 1800s, which was the Christians, Protestants, and in many cases Catholics, made a theological wrong turn, which the Bible never gave them permission to do. It came through a misinterpretation of the Bible. They became, the Christians became anti-intellectual, anti-science, anti-art, anti-thinking, and anti-ideas, anti-big-picture thinking, anti-music and literature and government and science, anti-intellectualism in every sphere of life. And because of that, the Christians kind of withdrew I mean, they were still in the society, but they were not occupying those positions of power and influence that demanded a rigorous intellectual development. So what happened was, as the decades went on, Christians were among the first to be dumbed down, by the way, because they already became anti-intellectual. And to this very day, the majority of the Christian culture. There are some hopeful signs, some hopeful trends in the right direction. But the majority of Christians today are anti-intellectual, anti-science, anti-art, anti-literature, anti-culture, so on and so forth. 
And that is, my dear friends, their Achilles heel. That is why they lose so many spiritual battles. It's not because God is impotent. It's not because God didn't hear their prayer. It's just the way God has chosen to work is in partnership with men and women. And if his people refuse to develop themselves, they're weak people. And so we have many, many Christians. There are many exceptions. There are many powerful Christians. There are many gifted Christians. But unfortunately, they are the minority. So going back to this one area, which is filmmaking, like it or not, even though Scorsese makes brutally violent movies, he happens to make movies of exceptional artistic integrity. And therefore, he has the respect of the world, and the world listens to him. And therefore, when he did the movie, what was it, The Temptation of Christ, or The Last Temptation of Christ, where... where Thousands of that I was there. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians. It was the largest demonstration against any Hollywood movie in the history of Hollywood, and and the, the Christians mobilized to protest the release of Scorsese's movie, The Temptation of Christ, uh, at Universal Studios. And I was there, and it, your your mind. I mean, it looked like the Exodus. There were so many people protesting. And I think it's a good thing that they protested because they spoke out. They said, we're not a soft target. But I cannot tell you how many Christians I've met who are endeavoring to get into a particular field like filmmaking or whatever. Not all of them. I mean, there's some very hopeful, positive changes, but some of them are just absolutely refuse to learn the basics. You know, like how to write a screenplay. And, and, and not just take one course or read one book and be so foolish as to think that you know how to write a screenplay. People who write brilliant screenplays usually study the craft and practice the craft for six, seven, eight years. Most Occasionally, there's that brilliant individual. Unfortunately, most Christians think that they, that they are that brilliant individual because God anointed them, and they're not. And their their character development, their screenplays are weak and infantile, and uh, anybody with training in screenplay writing or directing or acting looks at it and and they're appalled because it's, it's artistically inferior, because the Christians think they don't have to pay the price of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears to learn the craft of filmmaking just like anybody else has to learn it. They think they've got a divine exemption. So, knowledge is power. The gaining of wisdom. And the first thing is, not only do we need to read the Word of God, many Christians have that part down, but you also have to do the other. Okay, you can take any profession in life, any calling or career in life, anything, from waitress to truck driver to business executive to filmmaker to software programmer, any, any, to gardener, anything. And you are either somebody in a job at whatever level, but you're very good at what you do because you bothered to study and pay the price to learn. How many of you have been in a restaurant? Most of you. And, and you've had a great waiter or waitress, and you've had a lousy waiter or waitress. What's the difference? That they're having a bad day? No, no. The good waiter or waitress learned, kept their eyes open on the job or multiple jobs, learned how to deal with people, studied it, practiced it, observed other people or waiters or waitresses that were good, and became good themselves. And see, we don't minimize anybody because, oh, well, waitress is not a glamorous field. The, we See, you can't violate God's law of use. God may start you out in anything, 
And there is a law called the law of use. And it basically goes like this, that whatever, if God gives you small things to be in charge of, that if you're faithful in the small things, God will raise you up to larger things. But many Christians want to shortcut it, and they want to cheat it. And so, well, let's go back to the waiter and waitress. You can say, well, anybody can be a waiter and waitress. Absolutely not true. Ask any good waiter or waitress. Absolutely not true. A good waiter or waitress has people skills, timing, sensitivity, a whole set of skills that he or she has perfected. For example, they know not when to butt their heads in when people are trying to have a conversation because they're in a hurry to deliver something or take an order. Uh, they're attentive to, to the customers in the restaurant. So if somebody needs a cup of coffee or water or whatever, they're aware of it. They make you feel comfortable without even you knowing it. It's effortless. They make you... They, 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 they don't allow their personalities or their mood to impose itself on their customers. See, there's, there's so many skills in being a good waiter or waitress. That's not an easy job. It's an easy job if you do a lousy job. But if you're in a business where they tip, and assuming they tip fairly, which means the better the service, the better the tips, that waiter or waitress, assuming they're working in the right restaurant, would make far more money than just somebody who's an order taker. You see what I'm saying? Now, years can go by, and let's say it's a woman. She may decide to go into a completely different field, but she has an asset over so many people who are trained in that field, and she has to get training too because her people skills are off the charts from being a waitress. And so that skill will, will benefit her the rest of her life. Let's just say, for instance, the man gets the calling to, to be in the ministry. It doesn't have to be the ministry. It could be the business world. And why is he such a good minister? Because he had to slug it out in the trenches. He just didn't go from a high school, to a Christian college, to a church, and never worked a real job. If you've never worked a real job, if you've never slugged it out in the trenches, sorry guys, if you're listening to me, you're not going to be that great of a pastor. How, how, how could you be? You don't, you don't know what your people are going through. I mean, the sensitivities that you're forced to learn, even as being a waiter, because a waiter is a servant, and a minister is a servant, so, so, see, wisdom can be found in anything, and with God, uh, you don't fall asleep in whatever position you're in, but if you're faithful in small things, and you're willing to develop yourself, you will grow. And that's exciting and dynamic, the power of wisdom and how it can change your life. So, Scorsese, a filmmaker... He doesn't have the greatest messages. It's kind of violence, resolving conflict through violence. Uh, but imagine if, imagine if somebody had Scorsese's filmmaking ability and yet could communicate something of a powerful Christian message. It could transform lives because of the uh, directing ability that he has. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. We'll be back in just a second. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. We're talking about wisdom and excellence. And one thing before we continue that I wanted to say is that the reason that the Christian culture or Christians or the Christian church in America and other places, the reason there appears to be uh, uh, an unusually high percentage of people that could be categorized as like religious nuts or crazies or whatever is because of the media's distortion, is because of uh, 
bias and because the Christians have chosen to be a soft target. You see, the Christian community has communicated to the society that, hey, you can't, you, they've agreed with society. You see, you can't pick on just about any group in society. It's politically incorrect. You'd be guilty of a hate crime, and you could end up in prison, and you're afraid to do it. You don't criticize Muslims. You don't make fun of Muslims. Nobody puts a picture of the Prophet Muhammad in, the gla in a glass of urine like they do uh, Jesus Christ on the cross. Why? Because they know that the Muslims will not put up with it. They'll fight back if their religion is demeaned. Uh, other groups, you try to mess with the Scientologists, watch what happens. Just go, I'm not telling you to do this. This is a rhetorical question. <laughs> you mess with somebody in Scientology, um, you will pay a price. You attack them with a film or something or whatever, there will be payback. They are not a soft target. And Jews, for the most part, are not a soft target. They learned. They went through Nazi Germany. They have all these organizations, these powerful organizations, and if you're going to be anti-Semitic and attack Jews, you better watch out. Many gays, the LGBT community, you mess with them, you're going to pay a price. There will be a boycott. You don't make fun of them. So the group that... Uh, Everybody knows that it can pick on because they're not going to do anything are Christians. And that's why Christians are picked on so much, because they have established this, this false spiritual belief that it's godly to be a soft target. No, I, I hate to break it to you. It's not godly to be a soft target. It's idiotic to be a soft target. I want to say that again, and I don't apologize for the word idiotic. Every group in society today is protected by hate crime legislation, laws against hate speech. In other words, they won't put up with being picked on, belittled, ridiculed, and attacked, with the exception of perhaps the largest group, which is born-again evangelical Christians, who are constantly attacked. And the reason they're constantly attacked is because everybody knows they're a soft target and they're not going to do anything to um, stand up for their rights, for the most part. I mean, there are exceptions. There are exceptions, but generally speaking. And where this comes from is, is ignorance. I guess a group of Christian leaders or Bible teachers or Christian themselves, I think Christian themselves with certain Bible teachers and pastors have falsely taught that it's Christ-like to be a soft target and be picked on. In fact, I know that's what Christians think because they use fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic is a, is a computer term, but the point is that they're not really interpreting the Word of God properly. They're being sloppy in their interpretation, <clears throat> and as such, they're paying a very terrible price for it, and so are their children. Nowhere in the Scripture does God say, stand there and be a soft target? And I can hear somebody going, they didn't use the word soft target in Jesus' day. Of course not, but they're synonyms. We see, what we have is Christians misinterpreting what the Scripture says. So, for example, when Jesus talks about the importance of turning the other cheek, okay, now listen really carefully, because... Most Christians that you meet will not understand what Jesus meant about turning the other cheek when somebody calls you names or persecutes you or whatever. They will completely misinterpret what Jesus meant by turning the other cheek. And again, that's not rightly dividing the Word of God, and that's what causes Christians to be soft targets. So let's, let's, let's define biblically and accurately 
what Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek when people insult you and call your names and so on and so forth, okay? Jesus was talking about, first of all, we have to have the context if we're going to understand it. Jesus was not talking about the interactions of Christians, Christian ministries, and Christian beliefs with the general society and the nation in which they lived. That's not what his message about turning the other cheek was focused towards. It was focused towards interpersonal relationships. So you got it? The focus of turning the other cheek is interpersonal relationships. So Jesus meant in, in the arena of interpersonal relationships, somebody you know, a friend, somebody at work, it's not some like giant conspiracy, it's just, you know, take the higher ground, turn the other cheek. Okay? That's what he was talking about. Don't retaliate in anger. Somebody calls you bad names, don't retaliate in anger. But he was talking about in personal situations. He was not talking about how Christians are to deal with a society, a nation, a culture, uh, a legal system, and so on and so forth. And there are other uh, uh, sayings of Jesus that are taken out of context also. Love, uh, love thy neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Yes, you are to love your enemies. You are to pray, to despitefully, uh, pray for those who despitefully use you. But you interpret it properly for crying out loud. You don't misinterpret it or you're going to be dead. If your doors are broken open by a home invasion, I used to, I used to teach this on the radio all the time, on my other radio show, live. And I'm teaching it again. And I, I, can, I cannot tell you the lunatic answers I got from Christians when I would throw this stuff out. It was absolutely terrifying. Because I would raise up questions like this, and I'm going to raise it up for you. Let's say, God forbid, you're in your house with your wife and your three young children, two daughters and a young son. Okay? There's a home invasion. A, a very bad, evil gang comes crashing through your front door, smashes the windows in, 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 the, in the back, comes through the back door, and within seconds... You got eight heavily armed, heavily drugged, drunk, whacked out on meth or whatever, really, really bad, evil gang members. Tattoos, stone, multiple prison sentences. They all have multiple rapes, murders, and everything else. And they are here to take your money, Take your wife, your daughters, your son, you, and do unspeakable things to them. Got the message? They're going to do unspeakable physical, sexual things to your wife, your daughters, and your son, and maybe even you. Who knows? Mainly because of insane hatred and cruelty, and they're stoned out of their mind and probably demon-possessed. Then they're going to take anything of any value in your home. Money, whatever, get your credit cards, whatever. Okay? Then, you don't really know, after they do all this, if they're going to leave you, and you people will be in various stages of needing serious medical attention if they're still alive. You don't know if they're just going to leave or they're going to kill you on your way out. See? Okay, so I raised this question on the radio. I was even more specific and more graphic. I mean, within, within certain parameters, because I wanted to drive the point on. I wasn't being crude. I was simply being journalistically truthful. Okay, so the point is, I ask questions, well, what would you do? Because there were many people in the audience who believed you were supposed to turn the other cheek. 
So, so I, I took it to its logical conclusion because I'm trying to teach something. So I'm dealing with this main, a male caller who's insisting that he wouldn't do anything. Okay, this bad gang, his daughters, his son, his wife, and uh, he's saying he wouldn't do anything. He'd just turn the other cheek. That's what Christ would want him to do, and he was just going to trust the Lord and pray. I got a whole bunch of calls like that, by the way. So I, uh, I wanted to uh, confront him and, and his logic and his interpretation of Scripture hopefully to teach them the truth so he might be set free and to set others free listening. Because, so I said, and don't get offended, because I had to do this to, 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 to move him forward. I said, so what you're telling me, the gang, you're in the living room, the gang's there, and I didn't get into specifics, and you're just turning the other cheek and, and praying. And I said, now, I'm not going to get specific, but right now at this moment, the gang has grabbed your wife and your daughters, and they're about to do unspeakable things to them, right in front of your eyes. And then I said, are you going to still turn the other cheek and pray? And I'm not trying to be offensive, but when we're dealing with, with like, like, a, like a form of theological insanity, you got to deal with it, man, because a lot of people think like this. So I pressed it further. I said, okay. I didn't give any descriptions. I just said, that scene with the gang and your daughters and wife has now progressing in front of your eyes. So you're going to do nothing. You're just going to stand there and turn the other cheek and pray. He said, yes, I'm just going to trust God. I said, while... And then I used an appropriate word to describe what they were doing. That would be appropriate in a classroom or whatever. And he maintained his position that he was just going to pray and turn the other cheek because of that which Jesus taught. And I said to him, you mean you're not going to grab a kitchen knife? You're going to do nothing to prevent it, to... to, to uh, Combat it. You see, it's one thing if, if like, he can't because he's, he's bound up or something. But I, I, I even gave him options. I said, let's say you had a, a pistol in a drawer. You wouldn't reach for the pistol hidden and, and take it out and, and take care of business to defend your wife and daughters or grab that kitchen knife or baseball bat or whatever. I gave him a bunch of options. No, it wasn't going to do anything but pray and trust the Lord. I had a whole bunch of people respond like that. And I said to him, I don't remember whether I allowed him to hang up or whatever, but I simply said that. I said, the fact that you are misinterpreting the words of Jesus Christ by applying, by misapplying the teaching of Jesus Christ to turn the other cheek when men despitefully use you and, and misapply it to this nightmare situation where your daughters and wife are going to be brutalized unspeakably, I said, your, your failure to interpret the Word of God or be willing to, to rethink your position and understand what Jesus Christ is saying properly, I said, you 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 will be responsible for God because, because you, you, your your actions and your belief are basically begging for a problem. I didn't use the word begging for a problem. I used some other words. So anyway, the point that I made to him is that in that specific situation, Jesus fully allows his people and expects his people to defend themselves and fight back and do whatever it takes to protect the, the lives of their loved ones. That's what Jesus expects. Jesus is teaching about turning the other cheek when men despitefully use you is not supposed to be applied to a home invasion, a criminal act, or something on a societal level. 
when when uh, no Christians can get jobs because they're they're being profiled and persecuted as Christians. No, you would protest. You would you would uh, hire lawyers. You would demonstrate. You see, he I said. You, you can't misapply a teaching that was intended. There's a number of teachings, like love your enemies. So, okay, so does that mean with this uh, home invasion in the gang and your wife and daughters, so you're now going to offer them drinks or something while they're doing what they're doing? Because, I mean, I mean, you know, that's where his mind was. So we have to understand that there is a difference in how we conduct ourselves in the teachings of Jesus Christ. And we're never to turn our cheek and, and look the other way or love our, uh, uh, love our enemies as, you know, and, and just and, and allow atrocities and crimes and brutalities and horrors to occur to, to, to innocent people or people that we love. Jesus never, ever, ever uh, um, was telling us to do that. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, which means your sub- love is not always this passive, flowery thing. Sometimes love is confrontive, and love w- will defend. And I get an illustration of that is that God raises up the police. And he gives them the power to use the sword. Now, that was a term for that time period because they didn't have guns. So, see, we've got to get the the word of God correctly in our head or we're not going to have wisdom. And God's people are perishing in America because they they are unrealistically, well, it all goes back to this divorce between the, the logical mind, the rational mind, the person that is learned, the person that... Um, uh, develops his or her thinking, uh, uh, studies. When Christianity began to separate itself from that kind of logical, scientific, rational uh, understanding of scientific disciplines and so on and so forth, it became it became Christianity became almost a cartoon of what it was supposed to be. And this all gets traced back to a theological change which caused Christians to go in the wrong direction. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. I believe you need to send this program to somebody who needs to hear it because people need to get very clear in their thinking and make sure they're thinking biblically not picking up a bunch of bad Bible teaching. The Christian culture in America is just baptized in bad Bible teaching because you can really mess your life up or you can cause innocent people to die. And one of the burdens that the Lord has given me, one of the primary calls of this ministry, Paradise Mountain Church and Paul McGuire Ministries, is to one, is to win people to Jesus Christ, two, to make disciples of all nations, which means to teach people of all nations, including America, what a biblical worldview is, which which means teaching them exactly what I just spent a few minutes teaching and sharing with you, the difference between Jesus telling his followers to turn the other cheek and then the, the time when you're not supposed to do that and you're supposed to use Uh, a militant defense to protect the lives of loved ones and the innocent from brutality and murder and cruelty, God expects you to defend yourself and your loved ones aggressively. You see, the confusion about it comes from bad Bible teaching. So when you're discipling the nations, when you're discipling people, what you're doing is you're, you're teaching them what the Bible really says about life, so that they can be effective and victorious Christians. If all you do is lead them to the Lord, and you don't disciple them, they can never grow, they can never get the wisdom and the knowledge and power they need, which is a prerequisite to to, um, releasing their destiny. 
And then they can never get to the third part of the Great Commission, where Jesus said, occupy the land until I come. Which means the land that God has put you in, for us in America, it's America, we're to occupy that land until the return of the Lord at the second coming. And occupying the land means we're to exercise dominion and drive the demonic powers off the land and and uh, exercise spiritual rulership and authority to, to create a loving, peaceful, biblical uh, environment. But you can't do that unless you first have been discipled properly and been given knowledge, power, and guidance from the Word. And if you're uh, wrongly interpreting the Word of God, you will be un- incapable of occupying the land. Do you understand what I'm saying? You'll be incapable of it because you'll make ridiculous decisions. So this is serious stuff. And that's why this ministry has been called to do that. And that's why, in order to do that, we are assembling, even as we speak, the technological equipment, the building of the television studio, the acquisition and purchasing of television, editing, production, broadcasting, camera, setting, lights, equipment, the social media enhancement, video production, computer graphics, equipment, uh, facilities where we can have people visit us and be part of the studio audience. Eventually that's in phase two or phase three. And so we can teach all these things but not just with me speaking. For example, this radio program will be available um, in video or just the audio. But we can edit in video illustrations to, to, to make these concepts much more simpler and to engage hundreds of millions of people in, in generations that are first and foremost visual and their second uh, in terms of reading or uh, auditory comprehension. They need that visual dynamic. So we are raising money to move visually in a very powerful and dynamic way by putting together an advanced studio at a very reasonable cost that will reach millions of people. But in order to do that, because this this is how you win the spiritual war, this is how you turn the tide in America. You have to reach the people. You have to do an end run around the the the, the mafia like uh, monopoly of the mainstream news media, the search engines, the tech giants. Man, they're, the tech giants and the search engines <clears throat> are censoring, 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 censoring more than ever before. Every day, I see web pages and websites and articles being deleted, and it's not happening accidentally. They're turning up the screws. So we've got to move now, and we have plans, by the way, to be able to broadcast, print our articles, distribute our materials, uh, produce and broadcast our programming. But we're already looking at options to the Internet and other technologies. And you say, well, that's going to be all confusing and difficult. No, it won't be, because... I believe God is raising up, even now, I've talked to people that are in the process of doing it, I believe God is raising up alternatives to this control grid they have that will be instantly usable by people like you and me. So it's like a no-brainer. If you're like me, I don't want to spend three hours reading an instruction manual on how to work my cell phone. I've got better things to do with my time. It's just something you plug in, and bam, then you'd be able to see the Paul McGuire report televised, no matter how badly they censor the Internet. But we've got to move now. And some of this stuff, we have to put down a down payment, <clears throat> because it's like the California gold rush. It's like people are, are, are buying the, these, these, these areas of dis- distribution for uh, television, radio broadcasts, and if we don't acquire it when, when it's still affordable, it'll be out of it'll be out of our price range three years from now because it'll be in the millions of dollars. So I need your help. That we are in a war, spiritual war, 
for the hearts and souls of mankind and for the hearts and souls of America. You know it, and I know it. What we do now, whether we act intelligently and obey what God is calling us to do, if we act now, we can change the direction of the spiritual battle. I believe with all my heart God wants to do that. It also means we can exert salt and light on the culture. And we can cause certain things that the evil one has planned. And I don't want to get into the specifics, but you know what I'm talking about. There are some very evil plans at afoot. But if you expose those evil plans with the light, then it's not so easy for the evil people to operate without impunity. So I need your help now. I need you to go before the Lord, just like I do. Not because you're perfect. I'm not perfect. Humble yourself before the Lord. It doesn't have to be a big ceremony. And say, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to join Paul in this spiritual battle. I believe in what he's saying. I want to be a part of it. Uh, my spirit resonates with what he's talking about. So I ask you, Jesus, to show me what I can do personally to partner with Paul and his ministry in helping the media outreach get launched and the other things. So, Lord, show me how I'm supposed to pray as a prayer warrior, an intercessory prayer warrior, somebody who prays for me, my family, the ministry daily. We need prayer warriors. That's the first thing we need. And then make a commitment to the Lord. He may lay a burden on you. Well, um, accept it. You know, you have to balance it with, with the mind of Christ, but accept it. If the Lord's saying, I'm calling you, the Lord's speaking to you right now and saying, I am calling you to pray intensively for Paul and the ministry for 15 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day or an hour a day or whatever it is, or every two days, or whatever, then whatever God's calling you to do, write it down in your calendar or daytime or whatever, and make a commitment and do it. Because I'm telling you something, as your brother in Christ, I know when people are praying for me, because nothing, we, I'm telling you, there's, there's no breakthrough, there's no anointing, there's no progress, there's no conquering of the powers of darkness, unless there's a prayer army behind us. So that's important. And then we need big financial contributions. And that can be a lot of small but faithful, regular financial contributions because a lot of small ones add up to big ones. Or they can be big ones, and they're a blessing too. See, faithfulness with people that have been given a lot to give largely because they've been given to largely and faithfulness by those people who are consistent and faithful with a smaller gift. But you see, smaller gifts add up if people are faithful and give regularly. And bigger gifts are a blessing. So we rejoice and are thankful, and I do the best job that I can in terms of personally putting my hand on every envelope, not just envelopes uh, with donations, envelopes with prayer requests or whatever. I pray for all, over every correspondence to the best of my ability that comes in or through this ministry or and even in emails. And um, uh, I ask God to bless it. I, I always look at the name <clears throat> or the names on the envelope and where you're from because I, I, I want to know. I want to be in touch with the people. Uh, that are partnering with me, and I want to pray a blessing uh, over you. And I do, to the best that I can. When I say by the best that I can, you know, I'm doing a million things. We're personally handwriting those envelopes. Intentionally, by the way. It's not because, like, we're marketing idiots, and, and we don't know how to use a uh, uh, computer system to print out envelopes and a mailing list. We could do that. It's not because our list is so small. It's not massive, but it's bigger than most. It's, it's just two people that, 
you know, when you get handwritten notes from people that are written in their handwriting and they're sharing their life with you and their burdens or have a prayer request, you just feel like writing them back in, in ink, <laughs> you know? So the envelopes will either have my handwriting or my wife's handwriting, and they've been prayed over. So uh, because this is a personal ministry, we serve a personal God. I meet a lot of you guys and girls over the years. You come up to me at conferences. I met a wonderful brother in the Lord who used to be a regular attender of Paradise Mountain Church meetings for a long time, <clears throat> and then he moved, so he physically can't come. Uh, but this was the Lord, man, because I happen to be in a location that I'm not in that often, and he's like never in that location as far as I know. And he saw me there, and he recognized me. We said hello. Well, that God arranged a divine appointment. And so we talked, and we prayed together, and it was just a blessing to catch up with him again. And he's a partner of this ministry. And so I'm thankful every, for every one of you who have chosen to be a, par a partner with this ministry. And some of you have written to me your concerns and your burdens and prayer needs. And I'm aware of what they are. And I pray for them. So know that. It's a partnership. So ask the Lord what you can do in terms of financial giving or contributions, and then let the Lord speak to you. You know, pray um, that the Lord would give you ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I just want you to know that, I, that, that we're in it together, and uh, I'm only as good as my brothers and sisters standing with me. By the way, uh, August 24th, which is uh, the day after tomorrow, I believe, Thursday. We're having a Paradise Mountain Church meeting. Um, I want you to come. I would, I'd like you to come. I'm inviting you to come. Um, we're holding it uh, at the Garland Hotel in North Hollywood, where we've been meeting for the last couple of years. And um, it's free, but you've got to pre-register. So you go to paulmcguire.us, paulmcguire.us, and you um, <clears throat> register and read the directions. If you take the directions, will take you three minutes to read. It's just like a map on how to get there, where to park. They, the hotel do, does charge for parking. However, if you don't want to pay for the parking, uh, then you're going to have to arrive an hour early and, and find space uh in, on one of the blocks around the hotel. Uh, or uh, if you order some food or something at the uh, like snack shop um, cafeteria, I don't know what it is. It's a small restaurant snack shop. They'll reimburse you for your parking ticket. But I would find out from them, because I don't know off the top of my head, how much you have to spend. It's, it's, it's a reasonable. So if you're going to get like a hot dog or a soda or something, whatever, get reimbursed. And make sure you arrive promptly and read the directions and register. And I'd love to see you there. I have, God has given me a powerful prophetic message from his word about what's happening in America, what he wants his people to do, and what I believe uh, God wants to see happen uh, if his people will, will commit to, to spiritual warfare. And it, 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 it's, it's, it's exciting, man, because, because the Lord's revealed something to me. Uh, and, and, and it's not depressing. It's not depressing at all. Um, and I'd like to share it with you. So join me August 24th, 7 p.m. sharp for the Paradise Mountain Church Meeting. We've been holding these local Paradise Mountain Church Meetings for, what, nine or ten years or something? And we have held them at houses. We've held them at different hotels where we rent conference rooms. Uh, we used to hold uh, uh, an Orange County service as well as a service up here in Los, Los Angeles. So I've got to meet so many of you personally. So go to paulmcguire.us. We still have a bulk discount on our books. You can still pre-order uh, Conquering the Matrix. And uh, I apologize that it is not out yet. It will be relatively soon because a lot of stuff happened that I felt I needed to put in the book so the book would be up to date when we release it. But 
You haven't been forgotten. You will get your copy. You did, you did pre-order it, and you will get your copy before the general public. So the minute it is, comes from the printer, no, excuse me. Yeah, the minute it, it is comes from the presses, your copy will be sent to you directly if you've pre-ordered. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us, and we're going to get into this thing about supernatural wisdom some more. And I think it's going to like give you the rocket power to make your, your life work. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Oh, I looked up, as probably many of you did. I guess if you were in Oregon, it was great. But looking at the solar eclipse from uh, Southern California, well, let's just put it this way. It was uh, not exciting. <laughs> so if you were in Oregon in some place, I think it was great. But but here, it was. I didn't really want to burn my retina out or fry my cell phone camera, but it wasn't exciting. You hardly noticed it. But anyway, I want to go back to the wisdom of God, supernatural wisdom, supernatural power. And you know what? God, see, this is this this whole thing about gaining and acquiring knowledge and wisdom. And what is intellectualism, by the way? When I say the Christian church became anti-intellectual, well, that's just a fancy word for anti-knowledgeable, anti-wisdom. Okay, that's really what it is. So when the church made this theological mistake, so that's why it's important for you to read the Word of God yourself or listen to Bible teachers that you can trust over the long haul who are faithful in interpreting the Word of God. It doesn't mean you have to agree with every Bible teacher on every single thing that they teach, but if you believe that you can derive a lot of benefit from their teaching, then you should listen to them. And if you don't agree with them in certain areas, then just put that on the shelf. So what caused this tragic mistake? I believe it was in the 1800s. There was a guy named P.J. Spenner, Penner, Spenner, yeah, Spenner, S-P-E-N-E-R. And he developed a theology called pietism. Now, pietism basically taught that Christians should not be concerned with anything worldly. That means science, the law, government, medicine, education, mathematics, physics, um, arts, entertainment, culture, literature. He taught this this, uh, doctrine that Christians should only focus in on, quote, spiritual things, like Bible study, fasting, prayer, going to a prayer meeting, going to church, uh, worship, evangelism, and that was about it. All those things were considered spiritual things, and P.J. Spinner said that's where Christians need to devote all their time. And they shouldn't be involved in these other things because they're worldly activities. Now, <clears throat> there was a little bit of an upside to what he was saying because when Christians did spend more time studying the Word of God, praying, worshiping the Lord, etc., <clears throat> they did grow stronger spiritually and it produced a certain uh, degree of revival. And the teachings, really, of uh, uh, George Whitfield and uh, uh, some of the uh, circuit writing of uh, uh, revivalists like Wesley and others, it it kind of flowed out of the pietistic movement. Ironically, though, I just happened to be reading some material today that will be in my brand new book that you can pre-order, Conquering the Matrix, And this blew my mind because I'd never heard this before. But P.J. Spenner, who was the the father of pietism, which, by the way, I consider a a false doctrine. I really do. Some people would say a theological era. era, I would say it's a false doctrine because it leads you right off the cliff. And I read that he was related to and his father was part of... uh, certain Christian occultic movements and teachings popular in Europe 
Well, yeah, they used the word Jesus and stuff, but they really got a lot of their ideas not from the Bible, but from Eastern mysticism and meditation and, and Hinduism and Buddhism and stuff and the occult. So it isn't it interesting that this guy, and he's a guy that only only a small percentage of theologians would probably even know what his name. But he was significant is because he changed the direction of the Christian culture, Christian leadership, and, the, and, and Bible-believing Christians. He changed the direction the church moved in for the last several hundred years by saying the only thing that was spiritual was like prayer, Bible study, worship, evangelism, etc., etc. But it isn't interesting that if you really look at his life, he and his father had their roots in Eastern mysticism, which is all about meditation, but it's not Christian meditation, and, and kind of otherworldly experiences where you're detached from the physical reality. So, so I believe that some of the demonic spirits that were in his family, and he was influenced by them also, helped pervert or distort his Christian teachings. Because you see, this detachment from reality is an Eastern mystical occult concept. It's not a biblical concept. So what he simply did is he took an occult uh, Eastern mystical concept and he put uh, Christian terminology around it. Nowhere, nowhere in the Bible uh, are the teachings of P.J. Spinner, the father of pietism, taught. And yet the evangelical church just embraced it and ran off with it and is still suffering from it today. Because what it did is it created a category that Dr. Francis Schaeffer called super spirituality. And I meet Christians, and I'm sure you do too, that, that are super spiritual. They're all into prayer, Bible study, worship, going to this meeting, evangelism, fasting, praying. But that's all they do. So they're in their own little world, and they're disconnected from reality. That is not what the Bible teaches. And, and that if you succumb to that spiritual era, which the evangelical church, for the most part, collectively has succumbed to that idea. I'm not going to name the names of famous evangelists and Bible teachers from a generation ago or so. But they were all pietists. They all believed in the super spirituality, and that's not biblical. True spirituality, <clears throat> yes, talks about what the Bible has to talk about, and it deals with heaven and hell and salvation and faith and prayer and intercessory prayer and prayer warfare, uh, prayer warfare and renewing your mind with the Word of God and living the Spirit-filled life. Yes, absolutely, yes. But then it encourages you, well, now listen carefully, because this is where the evangelicals miss the boat. It encourages you to take all that spiritual power that you're getting from reading the Word and praying, but then you're supposed to apply that spiritual power and those kingdom principles in the real world and transform it in the name of Jesus so that the gospel can be preached, so that the kingdom of God uh, and God's purposes can be accomplished in the earth. You don't just live in a teepee somewhere and, and, and speak in tongues, okay? So it's critical that we understand the definition. Now, the consequences of Christians being super spiritual is for the last several hundred years, we have had little or minimal, and with few exceptions, excellent artists, excellent filmmakers, excellent business people, excellent governmental leaders, excellent uh, 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 scientists, excellent uh, sculptors, painters, directors, actors, novelists, uh, legal experts, uh, uh, politicians, so on and so forth. There's a separation between Christianity and uh, reality and the reality that shapes our culture. So if we want to, to, to preach the gospel, then we need to 
remarry, if you will, the intellectual disciplines as well as the spiritual disciplines. If we want to make disciples of all nations, we better well know how the Bible or a biblical worldview applies to every sphere of life. And if we're going to victoriously occupy the land that Jesus Christ gave us to occupy, we're going to have to remarry and end this divorce between the kingdom of God, spiritual powers, spiritual principles, and the basic wisdom and dynamics for effective living, whether it's scientific, sociological, political, organizational, business, economics, physics, mathematics, medicine, whatever it is, music, we need to, to be masters of those disciplines. So now we have America in the greatest spiritual battle that it's ever been in, and, and here are the consequences. If you know history, which you should, because you shouldn't be a pietist, if you know history, you're not going to repeat it. You're going to learn from it. I can tell you from the serious study of history, philosophy, various ideologies, theology, science, art, culture, film, I have studied a very broad range of Fields. I was once attacked viciously by a Christian publisher over that very thing. An internal memo that was not supposed to go to me, it was supposed to go. These two brothers owned this Christian publishing company, and they had been rather successful. Uh, I don't want to give away their names. I could, but there's no reason to. Uh, and my book that I submitted to them uh, because I was recommended to them by their highest selling, best selling author that basically built the publishing company. So I submitted my manuscript to them, which, which, which dealt like all my work with a, a, a wide spectrum of subjects because that's my thing. I, I connect the dots. See, in a, in a world where everybody's a specialist, there's a need for specialists. But there's also the need for people who know a great deal. They may not be, uh, you know, be a physician-level expert on medicine, but they know in depth about medicine. So that there has to be people who, who can connect all these dots from these different fields and connect them together into a meaningful picture so we can navigate our way through life successfully. Okay? There's got to be people who know a lot about a lot of different fields, not just specialists. There's room for both. So I got an internal memo that was from one brother to the other, along with my rejection of my manuscript. By the way, if you're thinking about being a Christian author, <clears throat> My first two books, I, let's see, I had 50 people at least, 50, no, 60 people rejected my first book. Uh, and then God hooked me up with a young editor who liked it. My second book was easy because the first book did so well. The second book, they grabbed me at a book selling, Christian book selling convention. But then on another book, it was hard. So the first number of books, it wasn't all... It wasn't all easy, you know. Sometimes it was easy, but sometimes it was a lot of rejections. So um, I'm saying that to you if you want to write, just be prepared for rejection uh, and believe in what you have to say. And uh, anyway, so I got this internal memo, and this guy ripped me to shreds with a personal vengeance. I mean, a vengeance. He enjoyed it. This was his turn on for the for the week, ripping me to shreds. And 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 the reason he did it, he didn't think I was going to see it. But anyway, his his basic, and he was insulting. <laughs> I'm laughing now because who cares? <laughs> I mean, he insulted the you know what out of me, just insulted me. And uh, his basic, the main thing that really drove him crazy is I is that I dealt with such a wide spectrum of topics, but that's what I do. And that drove him crazy. 
He wanted somebody who was a specialist who was going to deal with one narrow topic, and not, that's not me. I mean, I can do that, but that's not what I love to do with books. So anyway, I didn't really mind the criticisms, however tough they were. It was the personal insult, like like every three lines, you know, he would just, just insult me like crazy. So I was living up in the Hollywood Hills, and uh, I called up the publisher. And I, and I basically took him to task. I said, you know what? It's one thing for you to reject my manuscript. I said, it's another thing. First of all, you accidentally send me an internal memo. Okay? It's not supposed to go to me. So you didn't intend it to go to me. But I said, the problem I have is that you would even speak about a potential author or a brother in Christ in such a negative, disparaging vindictive and kind of sick way. I mean, the guy took a perverse delight in taking me apart piece by piece. I said, I got a problem with that. You're representing yourself as a Christian, uh, a prominent Christian publishing firm. I happen to know personally your best-selling author, who's famous and, and highly respected. What do you think what would happen if I, if I sent him a copy of, of what you'd said about me. I said, I don't care if you reject the book. This, somebody will publish it. So the guy, these people were arrogant. They didn't really apologize. They, the only thing they cared about was that I might show what they wrote about me to their big author, or, or I might circulate it to some other authors in the industry, and they would be exposed. That's the only thing they cared about. There was no apology. And then I said, you know, I got better things to do with my life than to, to, to fight with these guys. So they said that they made me um, mail back. They made me. They didn't have any legal right to make me do anything. They, re they made me mail back the copy because their only concern was not what they had done. Their only concern was uh, uh, that, that, they, that they would get caught and exposed. Yeah, okay, so I mailed them a copy and I kept a copy for myself. And then I forgot about it. If I, if I didn't throw it away, I put it away somewhere. I'll never see it again. And this is the first time I've even thought about it. But it hurt for a couple of years, and I had to really give it over to the Lord. So what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is years go by, and Paul McGuire is not this obscure author that, you know, you can you can rip me apart, but but you just rip me apart for sport. Now, I'm not saying this is some kind of egocentric vindication. I'm just saying, hey, God bless me. The very thing that they cursed me over was my gift. Now, that took a long time to understand because I felt shame. I'll be really honest with you. I felt shame about, well, gee, I'm this guy who deals with all these topics. But the Lord began to speak to me and deal with me and say, Paul, that is your gift. That's what I called you to do. It doesn't matter what they think of you. And it really didn't. They, di they disappeared into nothingness and became an obscure publishing company. He said, it doesn't matter what they think of you. And, I'm and I'd like to share that with you. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes what you get criticized for is what we need to get criticized for, and we need to humble ourselves and be flexible to the input and change. But sometimes we're spoken to in very negative ways out of jealousy or impure motives or just the devil speaking through somebody. And the very thing they're attacking us over is our gift. So just remember that. That what other people think is wrong with you may be your gift. So something to think about. Wisdom. So we want to take back America. We want it to change a tide in the spiritual battle. But we cannot do that unless we effectively reach and communicate the people that are right now, so to speak, standing in the valley of decision. There's millions and millions of people in America, Europe, and around the world, especially millennials and a whole number of generations, and they're processing the information with Trump and the political upheaval, and they're choosing which philosophy, what economic beliefs, uh, they think are true, and they're going to 
use their vote, their energy, their influence to move our nation forward in the direction that they believe is the good one. Now, the problem with that is that a significant majority of millennials and people of a number of generations have been brainwashed and indoctrinated by the educational system and the media, and I'm not using those terms flippantly, into believing in a system. You know, I have people in my own family that I'm dealing with this. They believe in a system uh, and a philosophy about government and life and stuff which is going to, they think it's going to take them to utopia, but history tells us it's going to take them into a totalitarian nightmare. And that's my burden. Because we have Christian millennials and a whole whole bunch of generations, and adults and non-Christian, and and they're all emotional, their image over substance, you know, they liked Obama because he smiled and he was hip. And when it comes to the content they are incapable of, and I don't mean this as a put-down, but they're incapable of analyzing the difference between communism, Marxism, um, socialism, versus capitalism, uh, a democratic republic like the United States, or the National Socialism of Adolf Hitler. So, you see, they don't know what what kind of society they want. And so they're believing the lies that are being very expensively marketed and promoted to them by people like George Soros and all those activist groups and Hollywood. And like it or not, George Soros and those activist groups in Hollywood and these people that make films and affect social media, they are very, very skillful, very, very knowledgeable, very developed, and very excellent and outstanding at effectively communicating their message to their target audience. And I've studied their their organizational structure. They hire people like in-depth psychologists, marketing experts, branding experts, merchandising experts, psychologists, television producers, documentary producers, social media experts, and they know who they're trying to reach, and they know what buttons they need to push in these individuals to enlist them on their side. And the tragedy is they are far more skillful and excellent at communications arts, if you will, than the vast majority of Christians and evangelists and conservatives. And as a result, not on the basis of which system actually works better for the most people, but simply on the basis of the image or how it outwardly appears, these Soros types groups are very skillful at creating a very uh, compelling image and they're winning this cultural, spiritual battle. Because the approach of Christians and conservatives is it's stuck in the mud. It's, it's, It's not effectively reaching and changing the hearts and minds of the people that they want to. And the only way we're going to keep from losing this country, because we could lose it tomorrow morning, a coup could happen. A coup is underway now. That's right, a coup is underway now. It could be a psychological assassination of Trump. It could be a manufactured crisis. It could be manufactured race wars, riots in the streets. It could be a terrorist attack. It could be any number of things. It could be a physical assassination. If Trump is toppled, there currently does not exist. See, with all Trump's faults, 
Trump has some positives that, that are way beyond the average, average politician. First of all, he has a political, economic, and social view that is fairly well-developed. He knows what he's for and what he's not for. He knows what works and doesn't work from the perspective of a businessman, not a hack politician. He believes in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. He believes in America. He believes in patriotism. And he's anti-globalist. And he's for freedom. That makes him unique because the overwhelming majority of politicians in Washington, D.C. right now, both Democrat and Republican, they are bought and paid for men and women that are totally owned by the globalists. <clears throat> they fake being conservative or they fake being liberal, but they'll, they'll, they'll slaughter America, which they've been doing for 50 years with their trade treaties and trade agreements and all these policies. It was their policies that caused NAFTA. You know, Bush, the Bush dynasty has his prayer with Billy Graham. They all act like Christians. Look, man, they, 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 they put NAFTA into high gear. And it was a flat-out lie. NAFTA bankrupted the middle class and the working class. It caused 70 to 80,000 manufacturing jobs to flee America and set up shop in third world nations. It caused the initial seeds for the 2008 housing crisis to occur. The actual income of the middle class and the um, working class was cut by about 60% in 2008. As housing crashed, as investments and retirement funds crashed, and we have not gotten back to close to where we were. And that's not even calculating in the inflation, which, is, which would make it far less than 60%. So the bottom line is, despite all the smoke and mirrors and flat-out lies from George Orwell's Big Brother-controlled mainstream media, people in America are, are facing a far tougher time. And these liberal radical activists, you see, that are not properly being exposed by the media because they're, they've been infiltrated by the media, these radical activists who developed their ideologies in the 60s, they're, they're radical Marxists, they're radical socialists. They're just, you know, in advertising, television, <coughs> Hollywood, stuff like that, they're congressmen. They um, are using classical Marxist revolutionary strategy and then the newer hybrids of it, like the like the community organizer strategies of Saul Alinsky, manufactured crisis, order out of chaos, all the race riots, all the turmoil, all the chaos happening right now is not happening accidentally. It's being strategically generated and manipulated through scientific mind control, brainwashing, persuasion, psychological, technological, uh, um, operations like emotional contagions and others. So they're using, to be blunt, psycho, very sophisticated technocratic, technotronic weapons, psychological warfare, persuasion and propaganda, and the media, and their communication skills to, to create a a civil war in America. No, they're serious about it. And that's called manufactured crisis in their terms, the Hegelian dialectic, synthesis and antithesis, merged towards thesis, the predetermined outcome. So they create the falsehood of a militant, radical minority movement and they create the, fault, the, the complete falsehood uh, of some kind of white nationalist, neo-Nazi movement, which is completely bogus. There is no white nationalist, neo-Nazi movement in America, okay? I mean, 
there's like this microscopic percentage of people, but it's not a viable threat. It's not like the left, which is a real <clears throat> entity. This entire white supremacist, neo-Nazi type thing, it's completely bogus. I mean, the percentage of conservatives involved in that, it's like, it's, it's made up, it's fictitional. It's a manufactured crisis. So, but they're doing this. <clears throat> and they'll amplify it through the echo chamber of the media. And they'll replay the emotionally provocative images over and over again. And they'll talk about it constantly over and over again. And, and big rap artists will sing about it. And you'll have commercials and images being fed to the conservatives and the Christians get to get them all crazy intentionally and then they'll they'll get the the hard radical left and minority groups all crazy and then you'll see riots and burning downs of cities and you'll see gun shootings etc cetera, etc cetera. and it's all planned it's planned so out of the chaos then they get to be the solution and then they <clears throat> Uh, end the Constitution and Bill of Rights with a snap of your finger, and they create a state of martial law, which is a military dictatorship, a police state, a totalitarian state, where we lose all of our freedoms, big bad time, <clears throat> and we are ruled dictatorially with no freedoms, no freedom of speech, no freedom of anything. They'll, they're already monitoring everything on your computer and your lives. There'll be mass arrests <clears throat> for anybody who's a potential troublemaker. And that's it. America will be like China, which is exactly what Rockefeller wanted. You see, all, everything that I just discussed with you is in my books. Different areas are in different books, like Mass Awakening, how this whole thing will happen, is in the book Mass Awakening, which explains the dynamics <clears throat> of a coup or a civil war and the psychological strategy behind it. You need to read Mass Awakening. What they're doing with the financial system is in the, my book, The Day the Dollar Died, how they're manipulating the money, the technological revolution there's going to be mass unemployment due to robots taking over jobs. That's in my book, Standing Down Goliath, which deals with transhumanism. In my book, um, <clears throat> the second book, which is entirely different with all new material, A Prophecy of the Future of America 2016-2017, deals with the money system, because you can't understand Bible prophecy unless you understand the money system and what their target objectives are with money. And then the brand new book, Conquering the Matrix, deals with the artificial reality that they're trying to make look real. And they are going to bring in their global government, global economic system, and global religion <clears throat> by using the techniques of psychological warfare, uh, propaganda through social media, television broadcasting, radio, the internet, and they're going to divide, create uh, artificial reality, civil war, and then take over with a military dictatorship so that they can bring in the new world order. Where have you ever seen, I mean, Christians need to wake up, where have you ever seen uh, a president who is legally elected according to the Constitution and that they have been attempting to uh, and wage a coup since before he got elected. And it's one intelligence, intelligence agency after another making up lies, threatening to kill him. <clears throat> um, it's just, it never ends. And why? because he is the only politician who hasn't sold out. He's the only politician who's standing for America, freedom, the Constitution, and willing to confront the globalists. So that's where we are. If we do not occupy the land that God has given us, let me tell you what's going to happen in a short order. Chaos will escalate. 
They will sell up, uh, set up a military dictatorship to manage the chaos. They have all their surveillance technology in place. And Christianity will be outlawed. Churches will be shut down. Christians will be persecuted. The economy will crash into a third world nation. And America will be hell on earth to live in, like Venezuela is now. Now, that's sobering, and I hope you received it as such. <clears throat> but I'm telling you this. It's not over. If God's people would simply obey the call of God and his voice, step up to the plate, gain wisdom, and if every believer would actually do what God is calling them to do, we can turn the direction of this spiritual battle overnight. We can win the battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in America. And we can see a reprieve, the brakes put on, uh, a time delay where God sends a biblical revival, uses America to evangelize the world, make disciples of all nations. We can see a restoration of economic prosperity for who knows how many years. As long as we're being faithful about God's business, we can see this turned around. This does not undo Bible prophecy, but neither myself, you, or anybody who pretends to knows how many years we are from the tribulation period. So what we have now is a window of opportunity. We need to be faithful to seize that window. That does not disagree with Bible prophecy. So I'm asking for your help. First of all, come and join me at the Paradise Mountain Church meeting August 24th. When you walk into that room, the glory and presence of God will already be in that room because people are fasting and praying. I will share a powerful prophetic message from God's word that applies to America that will give you hope, real hope, not fake hope. Then there will be a time of ministry where the power of the Lord will move, but all things decently in order, and I will make myself available to pray for every single person who wants prayer personally. And we've seen miracles, healings, deliverances, miraculous answers to prayer in, in just, just an amazing way, just because we're faithful to preach God's word. So you have to, it's free, but you have to pre-register at paulmcguire.us. And then finally, The reason Adolf Hitler, demonically possessed and the occult secret societies were able to take over Germany was that Wall Street, <clears throat> the international banking families, bankrolled the Nazis and Hitler through the occult secret societies. Many other wars and battles and conflicts occurred and evil won because there was secret financing from evil sources. I'm talking about a law-abiding, peaceful, spiritual war that is winnable, that we can win now by changing the hearts and minds of the people. But it needs, we need a peaceful, law-abiding, spiritual warfare budget. And when we take this media technology and use it effectively, we will turn the tide along with your fasting, prayer, and intercession. We will turn the tide of the spiritual battle. We will not see our president go down in bullets if we occupy the land until he comes, Jesus. Period. This is about winning until the Lord returns. This is not about mission impossible. This is mission possible because Jesus is Lord. Would you join me in taking the land till the Lord returns and winning this war? I'm asking you to ask God what he wants you to do in terms of financial contributions, how much to give, and then please, as big as God speaks to you, that's how big you should contribute. How faithfully God is to you, that's how faithfully you contribute. And I promise you something. You will live to see the day through our partnership, where a handful of us, a remnant that love Jesus Christ, we will turn the tide in the spiritual battle. 
And your children and grandchildren will have a life worth living for. And millions of souls will come to Jesus Christ. After all, you and I were called for such a time as this. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And I'll see you Thursday, uh, uh, August 24th at the Paradise Mountain Church meeting.